What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. We're seeing uh, we're seeing more properties like this being built in front of a house. It's going to be torn down soon. I understand that there are power lines that are just kind of close. What's up again? This is Dan Fradenberg, and that there is a commercial real estate building. I'm joined today with Daryl Murphy Sr. Good to see you, Daryl. How you doing? Hey, I'm okay, Dan. What about yourself? I can't really complain, but that's not why you are here. So you in the audience, this is what's going on. I interview commercial real estate investors like Daryl Murphy Sr. And then what I do is I go through the five different motivations that I found are distinct among commercial real estate investors. And I say, what combination of those describe you best? Then I go through the six different roles in a commercial deal using my Dan Does Deals commercial roll die. You can go to dandoesdeals.com and download your own one completely for free. You don't even have to give me your email address because I'm being a dummy, but you can download that. You can teach your friends and family the how to effectively communicate in commercial real estate and how the whole stuff works. But uh, Daryl, can you please introduce yourself uh, for the audience, please? Sure. My name, you know, my name is Daryl Murphy Sr. Um, I've been in commercial real estate for around six years. I've been investing for way longer than that, but six years commercial. Um, I'm also uh, a broker, well, a, a, um, a, a commercial realtor that specializes in commercial multifamily with KW Commercial. And I also have, I also run my own commercial multifamily masterminds every Tuesday at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So, and I have a team and I have a mentorship program. All right, beautiful. So let's get to the motivation piece then. I always start off with the motivation piece because even the beginners know what their motivation is, even if they don't know what role they're going to play in. So here are the five distinct motivations that I found in this industry. The first one is preserving your purchasing power. So if you own a family office or you basically rely on the cash flow that comes from the assets you own, then your biggest concern is going to be preserving your purchasing power because inflation eats away at the purchasing power of that cash flow. So you have to keep on making more acquisitions to, so that uh, inflation, inflation doesn't ruin the party. But the next reason is my one which is trading time for wealth i've got a background in e-commerce technology specifically the crms so it's mass emailing online funnels lead so lead capture and sales funnels and all that sort of stuff but if you have a high salary if you're a high wage earner that also means you're high, you're paying the heaviest form of tax which is income tax so it hit me why don't i pivot over so i'm getting onto these gp teams and i'm being rewarded for my effort with wealth rather than with uh, salary. So that's my motivation. The next one is fast tracking retirement, by far the most common one. And there are a couple things that are implied in fast tracking retirement, just to make it clear. The biggest thing is that you're, you want to get to the point where you're working maybe one week a month or one day a week or something like that. You're looking to take it easy. Maybe you're going to become an accredited investor and then you'll move someplace with a low cost of living, you know, something like that. But you know, the idea is that you don't don't want to be hustling and grinding 24 seven for your entire life. Whereas the next group, they totally are because they want to buy their entire hometown. They just won't be happy until they got everything and they're just really sticking it to everybody. Maybe they're, maybe they're looking for generational wealth. Maybe they want to make sure their great grandchildren never have to hold a day job, but that level of ambition is a special thing. They're also very handy to have in a GP team, but that's in contrast to the last group. Some people choose a sector of society, or maybe it's the environment or animal maybe it's the tenants themselves and they say I want to make a huge impact and they realize that accumulating wealth and taking on responsibility is by far the biggest vehicle for making that sort of difference in the world so uh, so Daryl what uh, what combination of those describes you best the second to the last the second to last all right yeah, and that go. was the generational wealth because because um, 
I'm an older guy. I'm, I'm not I'm not young like some of you guys, man. I'm an older gentleman. So what I'm looking for is building a legacy for my uh, uh, children's children whenever they decide to get here. So that's the reason why, that's one, that's just one of the many reasons why um, I'm pushed every single morning to get up and to write, underwrite deals, to make connections with people like Dan and to do what I'm doing. It's because of my family. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful thing. And, and it's, uh, it, it's especially great, you know, with, with so many families where, you know, it, it's somebody's not around or, or something like that. I, th I think it's really uh, something to, to make a big point of is that you want to be there and make a difference. So let's, uh, let's talk about the different roles and the core competencies. You already mentioned a couple, like you mentioned the underwriting, but I'll take it from the start just so that you and the audience can communicate effectively and you know the different uh, six pieces. So right. the first one, you already mentioned the underwriting. That's part of being a repositioner. The idea of a repositioner is they look at a bunch of different properties and then they do the underwriting, which is doing the math. They're finding out if the business is actually making what they say it is. And then they're also looking for upside. They're trying to find out what can I do to make this property make more money? And they have two main tools in their tool belt to do that. First one is more efficient operations. You make sure that those Benjamins stop going down the toilet, but there's more to operations than just unclogging toilets and collecting rent and doing bookkeeping. There's also a marketing piece, which is one of my fortes. The marketing part is to make sure that the vacancy rate stays low. So that's one of the big ways that a repositioner can find upside. The second tool in their tool belt is you get a contractor team. You do what's called a value add. You make the place actually nicer so that that way people will pay more in rent for the same building but there's a problem if you're a repositioner like me and you're from the internet you're gonna need a local okay you're gonna need boots yeah. on the ground somebody mm -hmm. who can go check up on the place make sure the contractors are using the materials they said they were make sure that they're they're keeping the schedule they're not cutting corners and then same goes for the operations team as well and if you're a tenant you probably if you met all of these guys you said oh yeah I met all the owners but it's not that simple. These are expensive assets. So you got to be going to financiers. You got to be going to the bank. Yeah, you have to go to the capital raisers and say, hey, I need tens of millions of dollars because this building is tens of millions of dollars. But I haven't mentioned the piece that the financier is going to want to know, even though it sounds like it's everybody. You still need to know who's the sponsor, sponsor. Who's the KP. All right. And a sponsor or KP is someone who already owns a similar asset. And the reason why they're so important is even if you're Elon Musk, richest man on earth, and you want to buy a 350 or 1500 unit apartment complex, you got a problem. If you want a loan, you need somebody in the fold who already owns a similar asset. After all, the bankers are saying, how, do our, how can we be sure we're going to get our money back? How can we be sure we're not just throwing our money away? They got a fiduciary responsibility, but those are the six different roles. And if you have that and you have the liquidity that they require and also a balance sheet of at least the amount of the loan, you've got yourself a commercial real estate deal. So Daryl, uh, what, what are your car comp core competencies? You mentioned um, uh, underwriting, but, but uh, is there anything else that you contribute to the GP team? Um, I'm going to say capital raise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the underwrite, I definitely do the underwrite for, that's something that I love to do. Um, and, but I'm gonna say capital ways. Now, here lately, I'm starting to um, pivot a little bit from the capital raise. Mm -hmm. um, a person can't do everything. You see, you, hold, you held up that dice and you named a lot of pieces up there. Mm -hmm. But a person can't do everything and really be efficient. So who was that? Uh, Henry Ford, who when he was in the, the court the, and, and the people was drilling, him, the, the, uh, the lawyers were drilling him on him being smart or whatever. And he said, all he has to do is pick up a phone and call, and call the person that knows what to do. So I'm going to say um, capital raiser, but I'm starting to really focus more on just my underwriting and I'm working with others that are more proficient and that has already built that whole network of capital raising. So that way that relieves the, the burden of me and I can really focus on 
my underwriting. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. And uh, so the other thing you, you already mentioned about how, you know, nobody's all the faces of the die at any time. And uh, right. so we all need help from somebody, but we're Correct. also better suited for helping uh, some more than others. Me personally, I'm better suited to help sponsors and KPs just because I build the digital assets of capital right. raising and things like that, the web forms and stuff. But uh, who can you help more? Who are you more eager to uh, find than anybody else? And don't break any necessary. SEC rules of enticing investors. <laughs> I'm able to help more financier, financiers, but I'm also able to help. I think that's not on your dice. Do I got to stick to the dice? Uh, no, 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 no. Please do. If my model's missing so, anything, I want to know. So I can help more with, with what I know, financiers, for sure but new investors that are just coming into the game mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I've made a lot of mistakes and I wouldn't, I don't want to see them make the same mistakes. That's why I started my mentorship program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. And, and there's so many professions and industries where they don't do that. You know, the one I always like to throw stones at is the medical profession and uh, physicians and doctors. Cause I've seen it where people in med school, like they literally work themselves to death in an ER, you know, like, they, like from exhaustion, they actually collapse and die. And it's like, I, do, I just don't see why anybody has that need to say, it's like, oh, well, I suffered, so you have to as well. It's, it, it just makes no. the world a waste, uh, worse place. Right? Exactly. But, uh, but the next question I have for you is your ideal property. And so you and the camera know what, an investor is looking for when you say ideal property, there's three main parts. The first one is the geography. So where should the building be? Okay. Second one is the unit count. Of course, there are different types of commercial real estate. So like, uh, you know, if it's a mobile, mobile home park or something like that, the unit numbers are going to be much higher compared to a multifamily one or a retail shopping center or whatever. Okay. But the unit count still comes into play. And then right. the last one's the class. And that's split into two different parts. They're both rated A, B, C. One is for the area that the building is in. So we're talking crime rate, close to schools, stuff like that. And then there's the actual condition of the building, which is also an A, B, C. So uh, Daryl, what sort of prof uh, properties, if somebody brings it to you, you're, it's easier for you to say yes and more difficult to say no. Obviously the numbers have to work out, but uh, what are some other features that you can mention? Well, I have... A criteria that I that my team and I and my mentorship program goes by. Okay, so as for properties, let's start off. Like you said, with the properties, properties, BC class, 1980, 2007, 100 to 300 units, three to 30 million dollars, five cap and greater, some value add, but I'm also looking at stabilized assets. Neighborhood, the neighborhoods have to be within a certain. Um, well, let me, let me break it down two ways. The city first must meet a certain requirement, okay? And it's in, um, the, for population growth, there are three, I think there's three or four different divisions there that I look at. So whichever population it falls into, that's what I'm looking for on, on that particular growth. Then, so then I look at median household income. That must meet a certain thing, a certain requirement, okay? Then I look at the house and condo value. That must meet a certain requirement. Then I also look at um, then I also look at job growth. That must meet a certain requirement. And I, and I look at crime index, and that must meet a certain requirement. Now, once those things have once those five things have met the requirement, then I go into the micro level and I look at the neighborhood. There's five things I look at in the neighborhood, and that's going to be. Uh, rent, um, income on the neighborhood level. I'm going to look at poverty level on the neighborhood level. I'm going to look at ethnicity on the neighborhood level. And, and there's one other that I just can't think of right now. Mm -hmm. But that's what I look at. Uh, you know, um, 
and, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic because it, it really shows that the level of detail and you focus on the demographics instead of just like crossing yeah. your fingers, you know, praying to the Lord that you, you know your your uh, your property is going to work out. And I really like that. And I'm also I know that uh, being on camera isn't the easiest thing on earth, but uh, those are that's the uh, the ideal property for you. And uh, you can reach out for more. But uh, Daryl, what what is the best way to reach out to you? We we found each other through uh, LinkedIn uh, indirectly because of meetups. But uh, what is LinkedIn the best way to reach you, or is it yeah. a website is better? Um, you can reach me on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. um, Daryl uh, Daryl Murphy Senior, and also you can reach me at the uh, on Facebook at Commercial Multifamily Masterminds. Um, I have a Facebook page, so and uh, and you can also email me uh, at Daryl at Murphy Baynard B A Y N A R D Group dot com. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, and your name is uh, in the little title of this video, yep. so you can notice it's a double R, Daryl. Just uh, so you remember that. And uh, I have one other thing to mention to you in the audience here, which is over here. If you take a quick look, you'll notice this this red button. And, and it's so ugly and terrible. And the only way to get rid of it is you click on it and it turns gray. And I love the gray button. I love the gray button because it means that YouTube will pay for this video instead of me, which is like pretty much my favorite thing. So pretty please do that. It costs you absolutely nothing. It's not even a cent, okay? And all it means is that these videos might show up in your list of suggestions, but it's really important to me to start making that Google money so that we can really make this into something special. But even just by hitting that subscribe button, you've done me an enormous favor. Just like Daryl, you've done me an enormous favor by joining me today. This has been fantastic getting to know you better, Daryl. Hey, thank you very much. And I would like to connect with you uh, again. Awesome. Sounds good. I just want to tell you, because I've actually seen your website, Real Estate is a Scam, before, and I loved it. Oh, and, cool. Uh, so, uh, yeah, because I think it's really so spot on. There's good stuff, bad stuff in every industry. Yeah, make sure you subscribe, like, and hit that notification bell for Dan the Man. And thank you. Uh, turn that subscribe button uh, from red like his beard to gray like his beard will be. So I met Dan through some networking groups for real estate investing. Uh, he's a great guy from what I know about him. He's uh, very ambitious and he makes it easy to come on with his questions and has a great setup. It's easy, it's uh, clear, concise, and I'd recommend going on his interviews for anyone that's considering it. Ah, uh, it's, it was unlike anything I've ever experienced. It was super fun. Um, the process was so easy a caveman can do it. I mean, if you guys haven't done it yet, you guys need to get on his calendar. Just take 15 minutes of your time, get exposure, find out who Dan is, what he's about. He's a true trifecta. Um, and if you don't know who he is, get in touch with him. Google his name, find him on LinkedIn, do whatever you can, just reach out to him. So I, I really appreciate the format. Uh, like, like I've told you uh, a couple times before, I, I think it's, it's really great because uh, me personally, I'm very long-winded. Uh, I have to purposefully make things more concise, but the way I take things in is uh, I definitely prefer things to be concise and straight to the point and concentrated. And uh, the chance encounters really do that uh, great for individuals. So you can get a good grasp on who they are, what do they do, why do they do it, uh, what space do they operate in. That's, that's why I love chance.